watch it and get close to the 10 15 mark. 10 15. It ends okay. at 10 15. Okay. I'll let sure. you know we have one more question. Okay. Probably around 10 10. Copy that. Eric, confirm you're going live. Eric Tawonka. Eric, is Eric live? I can't hear him. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. All right. Facebook, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. All right, station, this is Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook. Can you hear me okay? Hey, Mark, we read you loud and clear. It's a pleasure to talk with you today. Uh, it's great to talk to you guys, too. I have to say, when you're building products to try to connect everyone in the world, um, connecting folks who are out in space um, is about as extreme and cool as it gets. So it's, it's awesome to have the opportunity to talk to you guys today. Thanks for doing this. So I think we should start by, can you? Oh, it's our pleasure. Can you um, introduce yourselves and your roles and how long you've been working up there for? Yeah, sure. My name is Tim Coper. I'm the commander of the International Space Station for Expedition 47. Tim Peake and I arrived on the 15th of December, and uh, we've been working up here for about 169 days. What a great place to, uh, to work and live. And uh, Tim Peake is, is uh, one of our flight engineers. Jeff Williams is a flight engineer as well, just arrived a couple months ago. And uh, this is his fourth flight in space, third time on the space station, so a great person to have on board. This is my second flight, Tim's first flight here, and uh, we have three cosmonauts on board too that are at the other end of station that make our complement of a six-person crew. Nice. So let's start with a couple of questions here about the science that you're doing on board the space station. So what kind of research are you doing in space that we can't do anywhere else? That's a great question, Mark. You know. Uh, one of the main things that we do is try to understand uh, the impacts of zero gravity on the human body, a lot of negative impacts. And so in large measure, we're an experiment. So we exercise a couple hours every day, which is a mitigation for the loss of uh, bone density and muscle mass. We have our eyes scanned because there's issues with your eyes as a consequence of zero gravity hmm. and uh, several other things that we do on board to try to make sure that when we go beyond low Earth orbit, we fully understand the implications of zero gravity on the human body. But well beyond that, we do lots of basic research up here as well because when you remove the zero, the uh, gravity component to a lot of physical phenomena, you learn a lot of things. So we have physical science experiments that range from combustion, to, uh, to fluid flow, to microbiology, and so we're learning a ton, and uh, we expect that to pay dividends long-term in terms of benefit for our planet. All right, so I'm curious to hear about what kind of technology you guys are working on that's gonna help us travel to Mars. Um, beyond, of course, all the communication technology that we're working on to be able to connect with you guys uh, to, to make sure that that works. Well, I think in general, the ISS program is a big achievement in terms of the path to future exploration. I mean, just building and running and maintaining uh, logistically, uh, learning how to operate it day to day and for the long term, for years to come, all of that's going to support future exploration no matter where we go. Of course, uh, a, a, an example that's been in the news here recently, especially in the last couple of weeks, is the uh, the beam module, mm -hmm. uh, the inflatable module, which we're we've got inflated now, and we're going to outfit it, instrument it. Um, it's a new technology, which will of course allow uh, greater volumes to uh, to be launched um, with fewer launches, uh, and of course, it's going to take a lot of volume to send a crew uh, away from Earth, uh, no matter where the destination is. All right, so let's take some questions from the thread. And by the way, it's awesome to see the microphone just flying around over there. Um, that is not something that I'm used to, even in our virtual reality lab, where we can make stuff like that. We just haven't yet. Um, so let's go to the thread. So we got a question from Hakim, um, which is obviously astronauts train extensively for this kind of a mission. 
But is there anything in particular that you weren't expecting or that surprised you? Like the microphone. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. And for myself, as a, you know, a rookie astronaut on my first flight, there were so many new experiences. You know, the training is phenomenal. And we have a wonderful training team all around the world in all of our international partner sites. Um, but it's the real experience of, you know, launching in a Soyuz rocket and seeing that first orbit of planet Earth going through sunset, seeing a moonrise, seeing a sunrise. Um, it's just you can't put into words how beautiful the planet is is from up here and also having the the privilege of seeing it change over the, the nearly six months that we've been up here now already and seeing the northern hemisphere going from winter to summer seeing thunderstorms at night time the aurora um, yeah. i mean it's just absolutely incredible so uh, i think it's all of those kind of elements that the training really just can't prepare you for you know, I have to say, I think it's amazing how precise everything that you guys do has to be. So just getting ready for this live today, which, by the way, is the first live that we've ever done to outer space. So that, that is awesome. Um, you know, normally at Facebook, sometimes we run a few minutes early or a few minutes. Sometimes we start as much as 10 seconds late in our events. And, um, and I just thought that that was the funniest thing. Um, but it, it's amazing how precise you guys uh, need, need to be in everything that you do to make things run, run safely. Um, so, all right, so let's, um, so what, what's the next question that we should, we should go to? We, we, um, on the thread, uh, Martha has, has written in, uh, that my second grade students uh, in Florida, she's a teacher, want to know, uh, how do you talk to each other if you're all from different countries and speak different languages? We know uh, we do speak different languages up here. Uh, Tim speaks British. <laughs> uh, we speak American. No, but seriously, we have uh, three Russian cosmonauts on board, and uh, we've had a whole host of different international astronauts up here, uh, Japanese, Canadians, Germans, all kinds of European astronauts. Um, and as a consequence, you know, we have to be able to communicate. Uh, but typically, when we do our training, if it's uh, a German or a Japanese or Canadian or American training, we speak English. When we go to Russia, we speak in Russian. And so we all speak mm. Russian to varying degrees of, mm. uh, of skill level. Our uh, Russian cosmonaut friends speak English very well. And uh, so when we get together, typically on board, you know, we'll speak either Russian or English or maybe a Ruslish, a combination of both. But uh, it's very important for us to communicate. And in fact, that's probably the biggest uh, aspect of our job up here is to make sure that everybody is on board and synchronized. Just like you said, it's important to be on time and to have things done well, but that's all done through effective communication. And that's really done by us knowing uh, each other's languages, at least Russian and English, well enough that we can train in both those different environments. Very impressive. So in addition to being top scientists and in great shape and very precise operationally, you also need to be linguists. So. So let's go to another question on, on the thread, which is a little more fun, is do food and drinks taste differently in space? Um, most astronauts that have been up here over the years will say that their tastes change a little bit. Um, I think it has to do mostly with, uh, we kind of get a fullness in the head uh, due to the environment. We uh, have a fluid shift of our body because the, the gravity is not pulling um, um, uh, down. Um, so that sometimes results in a stuffiness or whatnot. So maybe our tastes um, are, are attenuated a little bit. Uh, so most of us like to have spicier food up here. Um, uh, the food can taste a little bland, so we'll, we'll spice it up a little bit on our own. Um, so I would say food does taste a little bit different. We, by the way, have a wide variety of food on board uh, from all different countries, uh, from the partner countries uh, represented in all the partners. So the food up here is very, very good. And is astronaut ice cream a real thing? We know that uh, astronaut ice cream that you buy in the gift store, that powdery stuff, yeah, that's not real. But uh, we've had ice cream on board. When SpaceX came up, they delivered a bunch of ice cream in a freezer, so that's been quite the treat. I think we're down to our last few bars. We're trying to ration it. So that's the real ice cream, and that's uh, quite a treat up here. Awesome. 
All right, so I want to make sure that we get back to our, our live community because um, this is their, you know, the first chance that, that we've had to stream live to, to space. Um, so Rob has a question, uh, which is, what advice can you give aspiring explorers like me uh, regarding how you got to be where you are today on board the International Space Station? You know, that's a question we get asked quite a lot. And if you look at the astronaut core, not just in one country, but all over the world, we all come from so many different backgrounds. Um, some people have come from scientific, from engineering, from uh, aviation, medical doctors, maybe teachers. Uh, the one thing that we share in common is that we're very passionate about what we do. Um, and, and we've worked as hard as we can to get where we are. So to any young people who are aspiring to become an astronaut, to become explorers, or just to go into the space industry, I would say just um, you know, focus on what it is that you're good at um, and what you enjoy, because if you enjoy something, that's what you tend to be best at. Uh, work hard at it, be passionate about it, and uh, you know, you'll, get where, you'll get where you want to go. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a lot of the same stuff for becoming an entrepreneur as well. Uh, so you know, one question that I have is I, I've heard that you guys use social networking and social technology quite a bit to communicate with people uh, back down on Earth. And I'm curious to, to hear how that goes, um, you know, how, how the internet connection works, and uh, basically, do you have any feedback for me on, on how we can make the service better for you? You know, social media is, uh, is a really nice way to reach your friends and family from up here, and, uh, you know, our internet connection is actually a relatively new thing, and so... Uh, we're very happy to have that because you know the whole world has become so connected that it's it really feels uh, feels good that we can s sort of be connected. It's not quite the same speed bandwidth that that uh, folks have down on the ground, but it's it's uh, good enough and it allows us to keep in touch with uh, with friends and family. But uh, you know, social media for us, for me personally, I can say is is great because it's one way that I can share the photographs that I take and and a few thoughts that I have up here because one thing about life up here it's so unique and uh, it is such an opportunity and a, a blessing for us to be up here that um, be able to share it with other people especially a wide audience I mean a huge audience frankly with social media is uh, is just a, a tremendous benefit so um, you know for myself I just I enjoy being able to share pictures and you know a few thoughts from our experience up here yeah, well, I, I love following the photos as well myself. So what do you guys do for fun when you're, when you're out in, um, in a zero-gravity environment? I mean, what's the most fun thing that you've found to do that, that uh, you didn't expect? Well, we do a lot of things that are fun. Uh, actually, we, none of us get tired of viewing the Earth from up here, so we spend <laughs> a lot of time in the windows studying uh, all there the details go. of the Earth. Uh, Tim uh, talked about the different seasons and stuff go, that goes by and, um, you know, the different lighting conditions and the weather patterns and, uh, you know, all the, uh, the geography and the geology um, and the ocean currents and, and thunderstorms, seeing lightning ripple across the, a weather system. Uh, that's a lot of fun. So we spend a lot of time in the window. Of course, uh, you've, you've talked about the microphone. We all um, um, can from time to time, especially around a dinner table, play with our food in uh, unique ways. Uh, so we all get to be kids again uh, and those kinds of, uh, uh, doing those kinds of things. It's fun to play with water and weightlessness and uh, you know, take a bubble of water and do different things with it. So just uh, the weightless environment and the view, I think, are the two main uh, areas that we have fun with. So you just fly around and, and flip around the space station? <laughs> there you go. That's what I was looking for. All right. So going back to a, a, a science question for a bit, um, thank you guys for doing that, by the way. I think it would not have been a complete first live to, uh, to space without uh, some astronauts uh, flipping around in, in zero gravity. Um, so going back to science for a second, and you, you were talking about how a lot of this is experimenting on the human body to see what um, what it can take in space. What's the longest period that any astronaut has remained in space? Um, and, and what are the experiments that are being conducted um, geared towards future, longer space travel and exploration? Well, 
We know I don't have the, the data on the records. I know that, uh, you know, Scott Kelly and Misha Kornienko just got back after, you know, very close to a year. Their cosmonauts have spent even more time in space. Uh, cumulatively, I think, uh, you know, the records will continue to be broken, you know, cumulatively, like Jeff, this being his uh, third long duration space flight. So, you know, number of days overall um, is extremely high. It's, I mean, it's really impressive that, uh, that the human body yeah. can endure such long periods in space, especially repeatedly. But a lot of the, experience, the experiments we're doing up here really directly relate to those long duration missions that will take us beyond low Earth orbit because we have to make sure that we maintain our, our bone density and muscle mass, that our eyes are in, in good shape. And those are three areas that uh, we're very, very proactive in. And we have to be, right? Because we're up here for half a year at a time. We just had an astronaut and a cosmonaut here for close to a year. And so those are the kinds of experiments that uh, they're really gonna lend themselves just understanding what it takes to, to go much farther. And so it's gonna be a step-by-step -step process. And you know, science is not necessarily a, a linear process where you, you learn things uh, in a very linear fashion, it's going to be uh, breakthroughs. It's going to be a lot of uh, uh, time spent trying to understand these phenomena, and you know, eventually we'll get there. I think we've made so many strides as a consequence of the International Space Station, and I think we'll continue to. All right, um, I think we probably have time for one more question. And you know, Facebook being a technology company, what I'm really interested in is you know, how, how all this works, right, scientifically and technologically. So I'm really curious to hear, what is your, your favorite or what do you find to be the most interesting uh, piece of technology involved in getting to space and operating the space station and, and all of what you guys do, um, especially something that, that the audience who's watching right now might not, have, might not be thinking about? Uh, wow, you know, that's an interesting question because actually some of the most exciting uh, parts of this mission have been the very basic technology, for example, the Soyuz rocket, which hasn't changed much since the 60s, but uh, I can tell you that was a fairly exciting way to enter Earth's orbit. Um, but of course, the space station is constantly being updated using cutting edge technology. Um, and we had the opportunity uh, recently to actually use virtual reality technology around the space station, which is quite incredible to put this, uh, you know, this headset on and to actually um, you see waypoints around the space station that remain where you put. Uh, you can use view procedures, for example, uh, have 3D mapping of the space station, have ground mission control being able to point things out to you. So that really has got a, a, a large potential for future operations, I think, on board. And it's something that's uh, quite exciting. All right. Well, I just want to take a moment to thank you guys. This has been an incredible experience. Um, it's the first Facebook Live we've ever done uh, with people from, from outer space, or well, in outer space. Um, and it's amazing that this worked. Uh, and so it's a, it's a testament to all of the technology and, and work that folks at NASA are doing and everything that you guys are doing um, to make it so we can really push the frontiers of what humanity understands and, and can explore. So, um, you know, from someone here on Earth, uh, thank you for all of the work that you're doing. Uh, it's really important, and um, I hope the rest of the trip goes well uh, and safely and that you, you uh, learn a lot of good stuff from the experiments that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Take care. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, Facebook. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.